Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I was quite optimistic in my first two books. Uh, in my first book, The Second Self, was about the power of the one-on-one -on -one with the machine. The second self was, was how we see ourselves in the mirror of our relationship with this new object. And then my second book, Life on the Screen, Identity in the Age of the Internet, wasn't about how we identify ourselves in the mirror of the machine, but how we... Um, really become new as we are with other people connected to each other through the machine. The new ways of exploring identity that I thought the computer offered at a time when my psychologist colleagues were saying, oh, come on, you know, this is, a, this is an information processing machine, or when they looked at the internet, they said, oh, come on, these, these games and stuff, it's just fantasy. I thought, just fantasy? I mean, what kind of way is that to talk? And I was so excited by these new identity contexts that I, I really wanted to explore it and, and sort of wake up psychology and say, look, psychology, this is fantastic. This is so interesting. All of that is still true. The internet is still an identity workshop. The computer is still a second self. None of that's changed. I finished Life on the Screen, which was about these new relationships on the internet, and I went back to MIT. And I had two experiences. And the first experience has to do with our online life. And I met a group of people who called themselves the cyborgs. There were a group of people at MIT, they were all men at the time, then some women joined, who wore the internet on their bodies. They wore, com they wore computer backpacks, they wore keyboards in their pockets, they had little antenna. Steve Mann was one of them, Thad Starner. They were the pioneers of mobile computing. But essentially, they had no more with all of this equipment that, that really caused lesions on their bodies than we all have in our mobile phones today. When I was writing about identity in the age of the internet and how we were going to be doing this identity exploration, my model of what it was going to be like was that we would wake up in the morning and have breakfast with our kids and our families, or in a cafe and be with each other, and then go to work and chat. And then we would sit at our computers and we would have these identity explorations online. Then we would be with each other again. Then we would be on our computers again with more identity exploration. Then we would be with each other again in our lives face to face. And what I was missing is what actually happened and what these cyborgs, as they called them, showed me, is that we would be always having the option of bailing out of our lives with each other at any time, all the time, cycling through all the time our lives with each other in the face-to-face -face and our lives in the virtual. And that we would want to we would want to walk the streets of our cities with our cell phones in our hands. That we would want to, as my research shows, go to the park with our kids and push them on the swings with one hand and be taking calls with another. And the implications for this are very important. It's not just that we are alone together, but picture a 15-year-old birthday parties. There's a point in a 15-year-old's birthday party where everybody wants to leave. And that's the point where things get hard, because the 15-year-olds have to talk to each other. And particularly if some of the 15-year-olds are boys and some of them are girls, it's rough. And what happens at that 15-year-old birthday party is that they do. They tough it out. They talk to each other. And by the end of the 15-year-old birthday party, they've done it. and they're closer to being 16 because they've done this hard thing. What happens at the 15-year-old birthday parties I study today? They go to their Facebook 
they, they go to their Facebook and they, whether or not they phys physically leave the party, they've left the party. They've gone to someplace else that's easier. And that's what we're all doing. We're going to someplace else that's easier. And so that's a phenomenon that I'm studying, this capacity of leaving where we are physically to go to the virtual, whether it's to a game, whether it's to our email, whether it's to someplace else, and somehow leave where we are in the physical. And that's what I mean by alone together. In our intimacy with each other, because we are with each other after all, we develop a new kind of solitude with each other, new kinds of difficulties with each other, because we're also elsewhere. Now, the second experience that I had is that I met my first sociable robot. In 1995, I met COG. COG is a robot designed by one of my colleagues at MIT, Rodney Brooks, that's a sociable robot. And sociable robots have the following properties. They look you in the eye, I maintain eye contact, I gesture in your direction, and I track your movement so that you know that if you move, I move with you. You're, you're doing this, I do this. If you like da, da. And basically, I gesture in friendship, I remember your name. In other words, I do some things, I, I know she's a person, I can, I, I, these are things that are very, very sim simple for an artificial intelligence. Face recognition, knowing where eyes are, maintaining eye contact, these are trivial for a program. It turns out that when a robot does those simple things, we are toast in terms of believing that there is a sentience there. And not just that there is a sentience there, but that there is a caring presence there that cares about us. And not just that there is a caring presence there that cares about us, but there is a caring presence there and that we want it to care about us. There was a conference at MIT about artificial life, and I went back to MIT and the teaching about the, the, at the Institute. And there was a conference on artificial life at the Institute. I went to the conference, and Rodney Brooke was demoing his new, um, his new um, robot. Great. So I visit his robot. And this robot, this, this was, a, was, was the kind of robot and I vis that, that could do these things, and I visit it with another researcher. And together we go in to see the robot, and the robot does this, looks, you know, makes this kind of contact with me, tracks my motion, looks me in the eye, but it's doing it with the other visitor too. And I begin to compete <laughs> with the other guy that it's paying more attention to him, you know. And it had to do with the color of his shirt. He was wearing red and I was dressed in glamorous black. And, and it was programmed to track red. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get over the fact that this hacker guy is wearing a red t-shirt and I'm in like my black suit and I could not get as much attention as the guy in the red shirt. And I saw how vulnerable I was to the programming of this thing. There are nanny bots, there are elder care bots, there are teacher bots, robots that are designed to take care of us, to say they love us. I'm not talking about robots that do things for us. I'm talking about robots that do things to us, that are designed to say, I love you, I care about you, I want to help you. Robots that are designed to say, you know, I want to be in relationship with you. And so, just as in the story of, of, um, of the internet, where I'm saying in intimacy with people, new solitudes, I'm saying in the story of robotics, we are alone in solitude, there are new pretended intimacies. And those are the two cautionary tales. In intimacy, new solitudes, in solitude with the robots, because with these robots, you are alone. In solitude, new pretended intimacies. These are the two stories that I bring together in Alone Together.
you describe the the robot as responding, the robot that you that you were at in this artificial right. intelligence conference as responding to uh, to the red shirt. You also describe your response to it, and it's then sort of subsequent response to you. Yeah. It's this notion, this is the sort of sentiment, this performance of understanding. It's this performance that the robot does of um, cocking its head, blinking its eyes, leaning forward, doing all the things that humans do, but rather than actually um, understanding as a, as a sentient object, it performs this notion of understanding. How is this different from how we perform online now? You know, there's performance and there's performance. I use the word performance to talk about the performance of a robot um, as opposed to, you know, the understanding a person can have. I had a strong moral reaction to giving robots to the elderly and having elderly people try to make sense of the story of their lives, talking about the deaths of a child, the death of a spouse to a robot that did not understand, but performed understanding of what these elderly people were telling them. The robots were performing understanding in that case. And I felt, I'm not happy bringing these robots. We perform when we go online as an avatar and play a character on Second Life. But in that performance, we are still human beings portraying an aspect of self. So you may say that the performances that we do online are not the same performances that we do in everyday life. You may say that the performances we do online have different qualities from what we perform in the real. I mean, in a certain sense, we're performing now. But that's very different from what a robot performs who truly does not know of the existence of the person who is pouring out, or the, the existence or the meaning of what the person they're talking to is saying. I'll give you an example um, of, of how I perform. Um, I was, for some unknown reason, um, in the independent, no, it was iMagazine, listed as one of the, 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 the people that you should follow on Twitter. One of the comments that they made at the end was that my, my Twitter stream was uh, fragmented yet fascinating. Now, I read that as follow this person, she's having a mental breakdown. <laughs> and I thought, let's play with this, right? Let's, let's perform. Let's start throwing things out there that are interesting, evocative, that are a performance of the self. What relationship then do I have offline with this Twitter stream? You know, am, I, am I creating no, a, yes, a mental you're breakdown? you're playing. In other words, that is a deeply, you're an actress, and you're doing something consciously with your Twitter stream that is a conscious, um, you're an actress, you're a performer, you're a performance artist. It's, it, it can be fun, it can be an expression of your unconscious, it can be art. It's not what a robot is doing. It's taking your wit, it's taking your sensibility, it's, you know, it's not, it's not random, it's, it's uh, to you, it may be, you, you may be trying to give the illusion of random, but actually it's you with your sensibility and wit, uh, you're trying to accomplish something. One of the, 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 um, the themes that comes out in your concerns about our relationship with technology, whether it's our mobile phones, this notion of divided attention, being able yeah. to drop in and out of conversations, or whether it is with these sociable robots, is this sense that, that our, our demarcations, our boundaries for our, our normative interactions with one another, as well as with these technologies, are being shifted in a way that we don't understand. What kind of norms and boundaries do you think might evolve if we do continue along this, this, uh, this interaction with our, uh, with our technologies and one another in a, in a path that leads us to be more alone but together? Oh, I think, I think we're going to evolve new norms. I think you see it happening now. I think. I think people sense that there's something amiss. 
uh, I thought that I was going to be writing a book about teenagers driving their parents crazy. And instead, I found, after years of tracking teens, families, that it was actually parents who were driving their teenagers crazy. It's parents who were driving and texting. It's parents who were texting at the dinner table. Parents coming to school pickup. We have a kind of school pickup in their cars. So this, these are parents who already have come to school pickup to pick up their kids. The kid comes out of the school, is desperately trying to make eye contact with the parent, and the parent is sitting there glued to the phone, going like this to the kid, don't interrupt me until I finish this call, until I finish this email. This generation of children has grown up seeing technology as the competition. I don't think they're going to raise their children this way. And I think there's going to be an evolution of mores. And my favorite line in the book, if an author is allowed to have a favorite line, is just because we grew up with the internet, we think the internet is all grown up. It's very young, we're in very early days, and we're going to get a grip. I don't think that it's serving our human purposes, the way in which we're raising our children, the way we're dividing our attention. It's like multitasking. Only a very few years ago, and I will not mention names because they are my dearest colleagues, education, educators went around saying that children, that the teachers, would have to learn how to multitask in order to keep up with their children, with their students because multitasking was such a powerful new skill that the, elder, that the older of us would learn how to multitask to keep up with the young. Well, now it turns out, for those of you who didn't, don't know this research, that for every task we multitask, our performance degrades. But we feel better because our brain rewards us with shots of, of dopamine. So we feel more and more like geniuses, and that we're doing better and better as our performance gets worse and worse. So actually, teachers shouldn't learn how to multitask to keep up with their children, you know, at their students. And yet, we just really learned this a couple of years ago. For years, we've been touting multitasking as a great thing. So we have to unlearn multitasking if we want to do better. So I think it's going to be like that. We're going to learn how to undo some of the bad habits that we've gotten into. And I think that this is just going to evolve. A lot of what uh, technologies have been built for uh, seem to be as problem-solving mechanisms. You know, we talk about solutions, computerized solutions. And this, um, this levies certain expectations that we have for what the machine should do. But, but given that we then communicate with one another via these technologies or, you know, when we're in the same room as, as other people were communicating with still other people via these technologies, what would you say are our expectations of one another based upon what you're viewing as our expectations of technologies are? Well, the worst expectation we have of each other, the most destructive thing that we've allowed to have an expectation of each other is that we will instantly respond to each other. Yes. So as the volume and velocity ramp up, we, we create a paradox. We say that our world is ever more complex and yet we create a communications culture in which we create the expectation that we will respond to each other immediately and almost without thinking. So when you ramp up the volume and velocity, you create an expectation that you'll get back to, you know, you, you, you have to get back immediately and you're angry. If I don't answer somebody's email in, 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 in what, an hour, two hours, I get, what, you're not, you're not on your email? And, and now with mo mobile technology, it's even worse. That you're, so I don't like to do my email all day. I don't like to have my email on my cell phone. I don't like to be always on. I like to do it early in the morning and at night. I, I like to have my day to myself, actually. This has become something that is infuriating. The idea that I'm not available all the time has really become infuriating. So we put ourselves like on cable news because if you need to be constantly responding, um, 
you can only answer in little bits that, that really show no thought. 